exciting episode of What Is My Podcast About? A podcast where, on a basis of once every two weeks, we talk about various topics in an attempt to find out what we potentially want to have as our everlasting topic. I am your host today, Matthew, and as always, joined by Keith. Hello. And Peter. Howdy! Howdy, how you guys doing? <laughs> I, I just want to jump right in and say that I take issue with the intro you just provided, Matt. You're setting us up for so much disappointment by suggesting that this episode is going to be exciting. I'm not saying it can't be, but there's the distinct possibility it will not be exciting in the least. <laughs> what are you talking about? Everyone loves your voice. Uh, I know at least one person who hates it. Everyone loves your quips. Everyone loves uh, the... Yeah, all the puns you're, you're making. What you bring to the table. Matt, you keep talking about yourself in the third person, and it's really weird to be a third, second person. You just gotta pump yourself up sometimes. Uh, so what's going on in the world these days, boys? Well, just the other day, on the Nintendo eShop, they released a demo of Hyrule Warriors. Ooh, the uh, Calamity Ganon War one? Yeah. yeah. The Age chance? of Calamity. Did you yes. get a chance to play through it? I played through it. They have the full first chapter available to play through, Ooh. which has two story missions and the side quests. And how is it? It's enjoyable. My one gripe so far is that the issue isn't so much when you're actually moving around and playing, but when you start to turn the camera, the frame rate seems to stagger a bit, jump around a little. Fair. It is a demo, and the game's due in about 20 days from today of recording, oh, yeah. so... It could be something that could be fixed, although, again, it's the Switch. It doesn't have the best processing with open worlds. Fair enough. But, um, uh, if anyone's familiar with the previous Hyrule Warriors game, each of the characters that you unlock and could play had a kind of token or badge system. You'd find materials in the world, in the missions, and then you'd unlock one badge and another badge to, like, say, increase your health or increase your attack combos or give yourself more defense against certain damage types. This game kind of scraps that badge system and a uh, change to a quest system, which is kind of the same thing. It just puts little quest icons on the world map that you're like, okay, this person wants you to do this, has a little bit of story to it, and then has you go out and do missions and such and collect the items to turn in. And so effectively they put like extra story bit beats behind the side quests essentially to yeah. get those increases instead of just do this and you're just stronger. Yeah, mm -hmm. instead of just harvesting resources, you're given specific reasons why you're doing the things you're doing. Yeah, and the three characters you can play as in the demo are Link, obviously, Impa, and Zelda. I was really hoping that it was just going to be like three of the four champions and then you just have the question of like, why can't I play as Link? Why did they alienate one of the four champions? What the fuck is going on with their champion choices? Uh, nice. I'll have to uh, check that out. Uh, in other game news, we also got a launch trailer, well, not launch trailer, a reveal trailer for the Rune King for League of Legends. Right, finally making good on that title to another degree, although it's still just League of Legends and Valorant. Yeah. But they are slowly becoming Riot Games and not just Riot Game S. I assume the S stood for something before, but now they are actually Riot Games and have a plurality of games behind them. Riot Game Salt. <laughs> and uh, we also, uh, it kind of in uh, Riot Games news, uh, today as of recording was the finals for League of Legends Worlds, and Dom1 is now the world champion for 2020. Yep. Yeah. Uh, which, uh, I was kind of neutral on what team I wanted to win in this one. I was like, ah, eh, I'm not really invested in either. But when I was watching the uh, the opening ceremonies today, uh, it was taking place in Shanghai, China. And then when they announced Dom Wan, like, barely anyone clapped or cheered. So it's like, okay, the Korean team is just like, maybe, just, you know, the 7,000 people in the crowd, they're not that energetic. But then when the Chinese team got announced soon, everyone was just losing it cheering. I was like, I want Dom Wan to win now. Yeah, after watching that bullshit happen, I absolutely <laughs> wanted Dom Wan to win. Uh... Uh, not game news, but uh, movie and TV news, I guess I'm going to classify this section of the news as. <laughs> uh, we got some very exciting announcements, which is uh, Disney Plus, a uh, series that's coming out at some point in the future. Uh, they've apparently tapped Oscar Isaac to play the role of the Moon Knight, uh, which I'm very excited for, because first of all, and I think... Just, just a little bit of clarification... The Moon Knight is the hero you brought up some time ago that has multiple personalities and yes. is insane. Yes. Oh, uh, he's yes. got three different personalities. Who may or may not be working for the moon. He believes that the god of the moon uh, gives him orders. <laughs> Fights the uh, champion of Ra, god of the sun sometimes. Uh, 
he's a very fun hero uh, who I'm looking forward to seeing. And the fact that they're starting to announce casting decisions means they're definitely making progress towards actually filming it. So we're making progress. It's getting closer every day. I'm excited. Yeah, and it's actually funny. Like a lot of Disney slash Marvel news as well. Uh, they've been a lot more clear about what they're doing for Phase 4. Apparently even Thor Love and Thunder has just started uh, production as well as they released a little teaser thing, which has that, like, 80s VHS feel to it with the logo with, like, the very static EV rock music playing in the background. Uh, They clarified what's going on with the Guardians, where it's more of not so much they're going to be in each other's movies, but it's going to be cameos. So most likely Thor Love and Thunder is going to start off with Thor being part of the Guardians, but for some reason has to leave. Apparently it's rumored that Christian Bale is playing the villain. Ooh! I mean, he's close enough to a villain in real life, so might as well let him play one in a movie. And he's, uh, I don't know what was the name of it, like the God Killer or Slaughterer or something like that? The God oh. Butcher, that's it. Yes. That's who he's going to be playing. Fuck. I, I remember reading uh, the storyline um, Thor, God of Thunder, yeah. which involves him killing all the other gods and leaving Thor as the only god left uh, who ends up traveling through time to fight as young Thor modern day Thor and old god Thor. Yeah. Uh, and Thor Allfather. Thor the Allfather who after he takes over uh, Odin's role and is the only god left in uh, Asgard. So if it follows that plot line which they're introducing the god butcher it's fucking weird but I'm down to see more. Yeah and, and uh, Hemsworth has already stated that he definitely plans to play a role within the Marvel Universe for the foreseeable future. So he's saying, don't expect, you know, like this is like, you know, the passing the torch that Jane Foster is going to be like the only Thor in the universe. He's still going to be in the universe, but they're opening up the door of other people being able to use the powers of Thor as the hammer was essentially eventually used for in the comic series. Yeah. The whole idea of he, whoever wields the hammer has the powers of Thor is an idea in the comics. So they're just passing that on and making it more of a thing in the uh, MCU as well. Exactly, and that's pretty much where that one's going, and then in the Guardians of the Galaxy, we'll see it also back and forth cameo. So, essentially, they'll be together for the beginning of the movies, just for continuity's sake, but reasons will pull them apart for not working together. Uh, on top of that as well, uh, not uh, Marvel-related specifically, uh, but Disney, Mandalorian 2 came out. So it's airing now? Yep. Yep. I take it neither of you have seen any of it yet? I have not no, had not a chance yet. to actually check I'll it out. I'll probably binge it once it's finished airing. Yeah, I'm good. Yeah, I already have several series that I'm watching, and I fucking hate the week-long wait for new content, so <laughs> I'm planning on just putting it off and not getting invested in Mandalorian Season 2 until all of it's out. Reasonable. All right. Yeah, so that's everything we wanted to uh, talk preamble about Preamble about? Yeah. Yes, I did just use the word preamble as a verb. Fucking move past it. What are we talking right. about today? We'll uh, amble on past, and... <laughs> I'm cutting all that out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, podcast is cancelled. Alright, so we're going to get into uh, today's topic, and that topic being Avatar, The Last Airbender. First question, before we decided on this topic, have you guys seen the show? No! So I have, but not in its entirety. Uh, I kind of watched it when it was on TV and didn't get like super invested. So I knew all the story beats and what happened. When we get to it, there was a few things I thought happened that clearly didn't, <laughs> and some things that didn't happen that I thought did, so we'll, we'll go over that when we get there, okay. but I, I had a spattering of the story, but I went through and pretty much rounded off those edges uh, for this episode. All right. I have experience with Avatar The Last Airbender in the form of the live-action movie before this happened. Uh, I had not watched the animated show. I watched the live-action movie and made the conscious decision of... Yeah, I don't think the show is for me. <laughs> yeah, that, that was your mistake. Uh, we don't talk about the live-action movie. It never happened. My favorite See, part from the movie is when the uh, Earthbenders do that huge baloo to do some earthbending, and then just tiny pebbles float up. <laughs> yeah. My favorite part about uh, the live-action, as I've now gone back and watched most of the animated series, I skipped over a couple episodes to save time. I'll be honest with people listening. I'm not 100% familiar with the show. Uh, but my favorite part is when they tried to condense the first two seasons into the one movie and then ended with the ending of the first season. That was fun for me. <laughs> it, it was just a trip. Yeah. A, a bad trip that no one wants to remember. So I guess to start off, we should at least cover what is Avatar. Yes. So Avatar is a cartoon, but anyone who shies away from watching it just because it's a cartoon, that is certainly not something you should do. You should 
actually think about watching it because it is one of the highest rated cartoons of all time. I mean, hold on a second there, Matt, because a word of caution, everyone. When I was watching this through Netflix, the Netflix constantly warned me every time an episode started up, fear and fantasy violence. Yeah, because fear. <laughs> fear was something... Uh, to be fair, when the face dealer first appeared, I felt fucking fear, I'll be honest. But I don't think I've ever seen the rating fear listed on anything before. It's just like, boot up, it's like fear. I'm like, oh, okay then. <laughs> no, uh, so that is something I've noticed with uh, Netflix, especially with any of the shows they have catered towards children. Fear is a very common warning that they have. Yeah, but despite this being a cartoon, it does tackle much darker topics, like genocide, totalitarian governments, corrupt leaders, so on and so forth, yada yada. So the story itself takes place in a world where there's four different nations of people. And they never name this world. No, they don't, actually. I, I think it gets kind of offhand referred to as Earth once, but I think that's in the context of Earthbending and not the yes. context of the world. Yeah. Because there's a, a later on in, I believe it's season three. Season? The, the comment about like, oh, yeah. what, space Earth, a space Earth. But it's not like Earth. <laughs> yeah, one of, that was one of my favorite episodes, and we will talk about that a bit. But, um, uh, yeah, so each of the four different nations has an element associated with them. There's the Fire Nation. What element's associated with them, Matthew? Water. No, fire. <laughs> Lightning. <laughs> Lightning also, that, for some reason, because yeah. that's also fire, I guess. Apparently. It would fit more with air, though, if you think about it. It really would. But um, then there's also the Air Nomads, who don't actually have a land of their own. They have four different temples. One in the north, one in the south, one in the east and the west. Pretty much each each country or nation they're in. Yeah. yeah. There's the Water Tribes of the North Pole and the South Pole, and then there's the Earth Kingdom. And they all kind of have their, I guess, aesthetic and their cultures based off of cultures in our real world. Like, the Fire Nation is a... Uh, based more off the Japanese culture, but has some of the structures and clothing based off of Chinese garbs and yeah. structures. Whereas Earth Kingdom is pretty much full on, like, hidden, forbidden city Chinese. Yeah. Uh, and then, I guess, like, kind of like... Like, the nomads, the air nomads are kind of like Shaolin monks. Yeah. And then, and then the water nation, uh, or they're the water like, tribes are kind of like... Like Inuit. Yeah, Inuit Eskimo, stuff like that. Yeah. Uh, so it's also important to note that while each of these tribes are associated with an element... I guess we can also bring up the concept of bending now, because yeah. that's the main way that this world is different from ours. <laughs> that association goes a little bit deeper in that a portion of each population of these nations are able to, what is referred to as, bend these elements. So they're able to kind of manipulate the elements to their will. Like air nomads, some air nomads, or pretty much all air nomads. I believe it's explicitly stated that every single air nomad was also an airbender due yeah. to the nature of their lifestyle. Yeah, they learned it through the uh, air bisons and stuff like that, mm -hmm. and being taught. Which, I guess, does that mean technically the air nomad tribes, you're not born into them, it's more so they find you when you awaken airbending powers? And does that mean Potentially. A, a firebender could be born to a water tribe? <laughs> See, that's the thing that... Uh, we're gonna get into it, I have issues with this line of yeah. thinking. <laughs> we'll fucking get there in like two minutes when we continue explaining the backstory of this world. But yeah, of course, Fire Nation people can, uh, a large por portion of the population can bend fire, Earth Nation, Earth, rocks, Water Nation, of course, water, ice, that sort of thing. Yeah. And each of these bending styles are based off of ancient Chinese martial arts. So, like, the air nomads, their kind of bending forms, the motions that they do are based off of a martial art called Baguzang, something like that. I'm not going to correct yeah. you. The Water Tribes, their movements are based off Tai Chi. Earth Kingdom's movements are based off of uh, Hung Ga, which I am, uh, I believe is a very rooted and has very sturdy and solid movements and positions and such. Yeah, kind of, kind of like for Earthbending. Earth and then uh, Fire Nation's based off of Northern Shaolin. Everything that's gone into the design choices of this series are all based on something actually like, cultural, or about these people in the world. Yes, yeah. it's definitely a well-flushed-out world. I, uh, there are, like, extended universe things. They did comics to continue on the series, as well as there's Legend of Korra, which continues the series on forward for the mm -hmm. next Avatar. And does answer, I think, some of your questions about those air 
bender issues. Yeah, so, there's a lot of questions I know get answered by the extended lore. Uh, I haven't done that. I haven't gone through core, so I only know what's in Avatar. So mm-hmm. I'll bring it up, and if you know the answer, maybe you can fill it in. Yeah, yeah, feel free to correct us as these issues come up, Matthew. Um, but yeah, that's one thing I really like about this world is essentially it started with it feels uh, when you look at the world building that it started with the idea of what if there were people who could semi-magically, not actual magic, but it seems almost magical, control the elements in various ways, and then they do the full expansion of what how that would affect their societies and all that stuff. And it gets down to the point where, like, even when you're in the Earth Kingdom, the way they perform all their menial tasks, the way they play fucking soccer in the streets, it's they really break down and bake bending into every aspect of their society. And it feels really natural, whereas in other... Uh, different fantasy stories they might introduce airbending but then have the world be very much like it is today and not address the fact that like how that would affect society yeah so, and it's definitely a benefit it has where it's a lot of things they'll try to draw attention to it like it's an inspiring thing but most of the bending you see throughout the series that isn't specifically related to like someone learning it or combat it's just kind of mundane in the background like oh someone just moving rocks or opening a gate yeah mm-hmm. and uh, in reference to the title we're getting into how the the whole story begins the Last Airbender. It's like the Avatar in this case. Well, we should probably talk about what the Avatar is. So the Avatar uh, is essentially a, sp- a spirit. Let's not get into too much of this. The Avatar is the one person in the entire world that they've created who is capable of bending more than one element, and he is specifically capable of bending all four elements. Yes, and because of this, he or she, the Avatar, acts as a kind of peacekeeper. Or moderator between all four nations. Yeah, they're meant to keep the natural balance of nature, order, and society, essentially. Yeah. And because of the fact that they can bend all four elements, they're supposed to have a vested interest in all four of the different regions, so they're trying to keep the balance and ensure no one region abuses their power over other ones or something like and that. And the yeah, yeah, Avatar is like one person, but it's also every other Avatar previously because it's a reincarnation cycle, and I believe it goes air, water, earth, fire. Yes. Yeah, something like that. Which, yeah, because like, fire was all, the last all I know, one. Yeah, air all I know for one. certain is that fire leads to air. Yeah, and, and air, air leads to water because okay. Korra's next. Right, right. And, and the one before Roku, which is the avatar that we get a lot of, was Kyoshi, Kyoshi. which was an earthbender. Yeah. Okay. Uh, now, there is something I want to address because the concept of Avatar, obviously, is we start off with, you know, Aang getting pulled out of an ice block, it's mm-hmm. freed by Katara and Sokka of the Water Tribe, and we find he's been frozen in that block for 100 years. Yeah. And the reason he was in that block is because he ran away from home when he found out he was the Avatar, and then the Fire Nation attacked, and then he got stuck in the block. And then we do find out later on that, specifically, the Fire King at the time, which I believe was Sozin, yes. was going to kill the whole airbending tribe to stop the Avatar from running his plans. But I, I'm thinking about that as like, we know that there's the reincarnation cycle. So yeah, he killed off the whole air tribe. Why did he never think, maybe I did kill the Avatar? Time to start going for the water tribes? So that is addressed. Yeah. Uh, first of all, he tries to kill off the whole uh, air tribe uh, to try and kill off the Avatar. It, he knows it's been 12 years since the last Avatar passed because he was close friends with the last Avatar. Yeah. So he's thinking he'll kill off this Avatar with the power of Sozin's Comet because it before that, it's just called, like, the Great Comet. Yeah. But after he performs this atrocity, it's named after him. Um, and his whole thought is he wants to wipe out the Avatar while they're still a young child who hasn't mastered the four elements. Uh, and then in the time while... Because even if the Water Tribe gets the next Avatar, it will take time. They'll be born that fucking day. It'll take years before they're a capable threat of stopping him. Yeah. So his original intention was to just take over the world in the time when there wasn't an Avatar. But there were sages in the Fire Tribe who came out and were like, yeah, no, we like can magically tell the Avatar is still out there. You did not kill the Avatar. <laughs> so he spent years fucking trying to hunt down the last Air Nomad who escaped on that day. But this is where I take issues with it. The Air Nomads, by definition, were fucking nomadic people who lived in four different temples around the world. But also were nomads who didn't live in the temples and just traveled about the world. How do you wipe out an entire nomadic people in a single fucking day on the entire fucking yeah, world? That that's one thing I don't really have an answer for. Because <laughs> they kind of skim over that fact and make you kind of just assume all air nomads were at the temples on this particular day. Yeah. Because 
As you mentioned, Sozin's Comet came around, and because bending the elements are connected to the nature, or connected strongly to nature, various elements can affect their bending powers. This comet passing by dramatically increases the power and efficiency at which that fire fire benders can bend their fire. Just like a full moon can really increase water benders' abilities at bending water. And nothing for earth benders or air benders. I guess just because they're constantly around their element. Yeah, I, I guess so. Yeah. It'd be weird if an airbender had a moment when there was more air around him than... In fact, the reason, or the belief that most of them spent their time in their temples, and three of the four temples, as far as I understand, were just up in fucking mountaintops, there's specifically less air above the mountaintops (laughs) than there is down at the ocean level. They spent their time with less air around them. Now, I want to say there was one benefit to Aang being the last airbender and us having this assumption that all the airbenders did. Is I don't think anyone would believe he is the Avatar otherwise. Oh yeah, oh, there's yeah, no true. fucking way people would believe it. But like, that's the other issue. Is Aang is a fucking twelve year old kid who's just like, there's a lot of pressure on me right now. I'm just gonna peace out, and then people are like, all right, cool. I guess you get to leave now. Why weren't like multiple kids just like fucking off and doing their own thing during this one day of the year? <laughs> uh, another thing I wanted to address too is because as we said, book one is book water. Where it's all about him learning water bending specifically. Yes, thankfully, at the time he's awakened, he had already perfectly mastered air bending. But in order to become the Avatar, he has to master the other three elements. So the story's broken up into three books: water, earth, and fire. And during those books, he spends his time mastering the other three elements. Yeah, and I have to say, Eng accepts hundred years really easily. Like, there's no conflict or like you know, oh, I don't believe you. I have to go see the temple thing. He's like, oh, hundred years, really? Huh, long time. Well. He does end up well, going to see the temple. I know, but like he accepts it's been a hundred years so easily. It's not the fact that it's he's been stuck there for a hundred years. That's the problem for him. It's like the tribe's gone. That's impossible. I need to confirm this. But he accepts being a hundred years in that block so yeah. easily. <laughs> but um, uh, yeah. So every episode has like a kind of opening. Here's what the whole story is about. It's like the fire and then nation. It attacked. all changed when the fire nation attacked. Yes. yes, that whole thing. So it kind of explains that a war broke out. The fire nation kind of decided, hey, we want to control everything and show everyone we're the superior nation. They want to share their prosperity with everyone, Matt. Yeah, that. They want to teach other people their peaceful ways by force, Matt. Yeah. So, yeah. And later on in the series, we find out that the monks told Aang that he was the Avatar before he was the, I guess, typical age that they always tell from the my Avatar. reading, they generally wait until they're like past puberty, like around 16 years of age, yeah. before they inform them they're the when, Avatar. When they told Aang when he was 10. And uh, they did that because there were new there were stirrings from the Fire Nation that they were being more aggressive and thoughts of war breaking out were starting to circulate. So the monks told him in an effort to get him to start training to become the Avatar faster to keep peace. Yeah. But... Since he was still so young, he's like, I'm the Avatar, I have to help people, I have all these responsibilities now, and also, because I'm the Avatar, my friends don't want to play with me anymore. Yeah. So he runs away from home and gets trapped in an iceberg. Yeah, so for the first season, essentially our core characters are, we have Katara, Sokka, from the... the, Brother and sister from the the Southern Water Tribe. tribe. Uh, Sokka is kind of just a general warrior, well... Uh, Katara seems to be developing waterbending powers, though she doesn't have a mask to win it from. We have Aang, who is the Avatar who's been asleep for 100 years and on a block of ice with Appa, his air bison. We have Prince Zuko, who is uh, the su- banished son of the Fire Lord, who is only able to return home after catching the Avatar. Also, he's kind of a little shit. Yeah, we have. At least at this point in the story. His and uncle also, at, at this point in the story when he was sent away on banishment, since it's been a hundred years, they're not even sure if the Avatar is still alive because there's been no more Avatars since the disappearance. Yeah. Uh, we have one of the better characters, Iroh, uh, who is his uncle, who is kind of his guardian uncle for this time. Iroh has the best wisdom in the world. Yeah, and Zuko is clearly supposed to be, I guess, the villain of the first season, uh, starting off anyways. Mm-hmm. But they immediately de like threaten him. In the first episode, because Zuko's like, oh, the Avatar, and he goes and he lands there. And then he immediately just gets made a fool of. I was like, okay, I see where this is going. He's he's pretty much the team rocket of this, isn't he? So I want to jump back just a little second to talk another bit about like the great story writing abilities of the writers. 
is we've already been introduced to the cycle of the avatars and the order that the elements flow in. So we know it goes air, water, fire, earth. Or sorry, air, water, earth, fire. And that's literally the order that Aang learns his powers in and the order that the books are written in. It, you can imagine a book zero is him learning about the air element. <laughs> book one is water. Book two is earth. Book three is fire. He literally learns the elements in the order that it gets passed down uh, through the different tribes. So, another cool idea from the writers. Anyways, continuing on. Yeah. Which, uh, the, oh, as mentioned with Zuko being the villain, and not that really good one at that. He's like, definitely the more emotional, like, angry yeah, person. Yeah, he's a very angsty teen, all about his uh, honor, and I have to redeem myself in my parents' eyes and come back home a hero. But here's the other question that uh, comes up in my mind. We have all this history of the Avatar being like the peacemaker and like the, the, the way to go. The Fire Nation has to know when they're telling, you gotta hunt down the Avatar, that they're probably the bad guys. Yeah. And... I, I don't think the Fire Nation don't say they're the bad guys. A lot of them that you encounter in the war are very much a-okay with how things are. Yeah, fair enough. Although we do get like a spattering of them, especially in the later seasons, which take place more with Fire Nation people, that not all of them are the bad guys. Like the one mind that comes to mind is it's actually in the final few episodes when they hijack one of the warships. Yes. And then it's like, everyone go down to the bottom of the ship because we got cake for a birthday. It's like, can you believe the captain remember my birthday? Yeah, it's true. I'm talking like, hey, I work in communications. I'm in the engine room. I guess that's why we never met. I wonder whose birthday it is. And then in the background, I can't believe the captain remembered it's my birthday. He really does care. It's like, there's no way that guy is an evil mastermind. <laughs> They're clearly just normal fucking people working for the Fire Nation yeah. who have accepted their lot in life. And another notable example of this is uh, on their way to the Water Tribe, I believe, they come across a ragtag group of like young people who live in the forest in their little tree houses. They call themselves the Freedom Fighters. They fight off the Fire Nation whenever they can. Yeah, Jet, right? Yeah, Jet. Which, uh, Jet was actually, I think, one of my first favorite episodes mm -hmm. in the series. Just his whole arc. Because I think one of the things that could have easily been done with it being sort of a children's show is they could have just doubled down on Fire Nation bad, everyone else is good who's fighting them. But this is where we start to see that this world is not so black and white as you want to think, which is setting up a lot of things that are going to happen in the last season as well for Aang's inner conflict. Mm -hmm. But having, you know, this person who's a freedom fighter fighting against the Fire Nation, who, for all purposes, is a horrible people up to this point, we see that, oh, there's bad guys on both sides, yeah. and Jet's showing that either side is, can take it too far. Yeah, like, Not only is there bad guys on both sides, but Uncle Iro immediately proves that there is at least one good guy on both sides yeah. as well. And also with this episode, the whole premise is uh, Jet's there with his freedom fighters. They've all been hurt by the Fire Nation somehow, and... All they want now is revenge against the Fire Nation. They're going to blow a dam and flood an entire little settlement of Fire Nation people who have moved into the area. And, of course, when Sokka finds out about this, he is absolutely furious because there are not soldiers living in there. Sure, there's a couple soldiers on guard, but everyone who's in there are just peaceful, like, farmers and people who are living their own lives peacefully. Which is an interesting thing because, uh, just going from the beginning, I find that there are... Two characters in the series that go through great character development, and that's Zuko and Sokka. Yes. yes the, other the other characters go through good character development, but they're really like the two standout ones. Mm -hmm. Iroh doesn't really have a change because he's already gone through these changes, because that's a big part of the story, is the changes these kids go through yeah. in this war of time. And but I find Aang is probably the worst character in the see, series. That's the thing, is uh, Zuko and Sokka have great character development. If you like read into the backstory of Iroh, he has great character development that happens before the series. Yeah. yeah. So he doesn't need to go through character development during the series. Katara has good character development, but it only happens pretty much in the first book. Yeah. Then she's pretty much fully developed. Yeah, and that's she kind of the same has... deal with uh, Toph as well. Toph, we get her introduction and development at the end of book two and the beginning of book one. But she comes in pretty much already almost perfect. Yeah. yeah. We get character... We don't get a huge amount of character development, but we do have great character scenes for them. Like... In book three, there are some fucking amazing scenes with Katara. Yeah. When she finds the man who killed her mother. Like, shit like that is fantastic. But yeah, oh, you don't yeah. see the same development get me wrong. of the characters. All the characters have great... Like, when the payoff moment happens for all other arcs, it's great. I just feel like there's two oh. characters that shine above everyone else, and that's Zuko and Sokka. Yeah. yeah, those two have the most growth. And it's quite possible because they start that much lower than everyone yeah, around them. Sokka's yeah, because Sokka's kind of like, I'm the best... Uh, women know their place and he's like yeah. he's very stupid and sexist for a good chunk of it yeah 
And then uh, Zuko, obviously, he's a villain. His whole struggle is about like what is right and what is wrong based yeah. on his own compass, and he's being guided by multiple characters, and he's trying to figure out which one is the best for him. Yeah, because yeah. he spent his entire childhood trying to win his father's love and respect, only to realize at a certain point when he's called into a secret meeting with his father that his father's love and respect is not something he should be desiring, and the fact that he sold out his uncle means he sold out the man who actually treated him like a son. Yeah, he has a fucking great character arc. It's mm-hmm. fantastic. And when you learn a little bit more about Sokka, you learn a little bit more about why he developed the way he did. Yeah. Because uh, you learn that when you first get to the South Southern Water Tribe, it's a very small little village with a couple of ramshackle huts and a wall made of snow. Yeah. And Katara is the only waterbender in the water tribe in the Southern Water Tribe. But that's because the Fire Nation sent raids over and over again to the Southern Water Tribe because they couldn't take out the Northern Water Tribe because they were so heavily fortified in the North. Yeah. Yeah. I believe mm-hmm. it's... I don't know if it's explicitly stated, but it's suggested that when uh, Sozin dies and passes uh, the role of Fire Lord to his son, his son becomes convinced that they actually did kill the Water Avatar all that time mm-hmm. ago and is instead now trying to figure out who the Water... Er, who the Avatar has been reincarnated in the Water Tribes. So he just decides to go capture all the waterbenders. Yeah, so they keep raiding over and over and taking any waterbenders that they find. And finally, Katara's mother, not being a waterbender, kind of gives herself up to protect her own daughter. Mm. And uh, Sokka, because all of the men of the village, including their father, left to join the war effort, is the only male old enough to be a warrior in the tribe. So he kind of has to be that... Now, I believe the, the death of the mother actually happens before. Because doesn't she tell her to no. go find the father? Yes. She's like, but then, Tara, go find your father. But then it's assumed that she's either... It's assumed she's either killed or taken away at that moment. Well, she's killed that time by... Yeah. Mm. If we go even a little bit more into the backstory. So we know that in the first wave they captured all the waterbenders at that time. And they specifically did not kill the waterbenders when they captured them. Because believing that the Avatar might be among them, they didn't want to kill them and just have them reincarnated in an Earth tribe. Right. They took Uh, them to a special prison. With no moisture at all anywhere in there to keep them from bending. Uh, And that's, I forget her name, Hama, I think it is? Yes. Uh, First develops blood bending uh, and kills a bunch of guards getting out and doesn't free any of the other water tribe people. Well, here's the weird thing, though, because this series plays very fast and loose with deaths on screen. (laughs) Yeah. Have something blow up just to serve someone pop up. It's like, who I almost died in there. <laughs> yeah. You have Avatar or Aang in fucking full on Avatar mode, sweep people to the bottom of the ocean, and then confidently an episode later say, I've never killed anyone before. It's like, oh, I feel like you probably did though. He was you, unconscious. You haven't killed people in the same way that Batman technically hasn't killed some people by pushing them off rooftops. Yeah. The uh, ground killed them, not me. So, anyways, uh, Kama escapes with bloodbending, and the moment the firebenders realize that this is a dangerous technique that can be learned by the waterbenders. They just decide to slaughter all the waterbenders they have captured so no one else develops this technique. Uh, and then they go hunting for Hama, which is why when they go to the water tribe and end up capturing and killing Katara's mother, it's because they actually, at least I always interpret it as, they believed that Katara's mother was actually Hama, who had escaped and gone back to the water tribe. And so they were killing her there to try and prevent the bloodbending from becoming a bigger problem. That makes sense. Because yeah, the they did say... In that little flashback that we got, that they were looking for the one waterbender that was still in the South Pole. Yeah, and they would know that a waterbender from the South Pole had escaped from their camp. So that would presumably be one of the ones they knew about. Yeah. True. And if they knew it was a child who was recently born, why would they kill Katara's mother? Because she clearly was not a child who was recently born. <laughs> Anyways, uh, yeah, bad shit happened to the water truck. But speaking of which... A hundred years ago, in a single day, the Fire Nation wiped out all of the Air Nomads, which we've already addressed the issues of how the fuck did they kill every single one of them in a single day. To be fair, they do specify that it was with the help of Sozin's Comet that they were able to death. So, we we only have to assume that all the Air Nomads were at the temples. Fair. Uh, But then, over the course of the next hundred years, the only progress the Fire Nation manages to make is capturing the Water Nation from the Southern Water Tribe's waterbenders. And no other fucking progress to be shown in the slide. To, to be fair, they do get quite far into the Earth Kingdom as well. Yeah, they, because they're, at the, they're call, at the gates of Ba Sing Se. They colonize 
a vast portion of the Earth Kingdom, where when you look at the map of the world for Avatar, the Earth Kingdom takes up the vast majority of the... It's like 70% of it. Yeah. And, uh... Well, to so be fair... They have a lot of it colonized already, and there's only a few free places left. One of them being the walled city of Ba Sing Se. Yeah. And to be fair, uh, Uncle Iroh does manage to seize uh, Ba Sing Se, and then, for reasons we'll probably get into in a little bit, uh, gives up the siege... But then, like, no one else stands up, like, as they break through the city and are capturing the city, he gives up the siege. And no one else steps up and is like, alright, I'm just gonna finish what he said. And everyone else is just like, alright, if he's gonna fuck off, I guess we'll fuck off too. And then Bossing J just perfectly reforms back into a city that is perfectly unseized. So, <laughs> I'm just saying the Fire Nation really dropped the ball several times over the course of a hundred years of wiping out one tribe completely and then... Not really majorly fucking over any other tribes. Well, when or, the royalty of the Fire Nation involves uh, brothers killing brothers in uh, Seek of the Throne, then... Uh, or even brothers killing fathers. That's another thing that happened. Or brothers killing fathers or a husband getting their wife to kill their brother in their stead and then go into exile. Fun times. But yeah, overall, weird shit fucking happened. Yeah, I think... Book one, Water, in this series is a bit weird for me because it doesn't feel like it's a connective story so much as it's like, it feels like the focus in season one is more so the world and these <laughs> little stories here and there with the Avatar just happening to be involved with it. Yeah, yeah. Because book in one or- definitely felt more like world building than proper yeah, story. Because yeah. they decided since Katara is a waterbender and Aang has to master all four elements... They go to the North Pole so they can both learn waterbending. Yeah. And Katara can teach Aang a little bit of waterbending on the way, so they stop here and there around the world. Yeah, we do get a bunch of interesting little stories that kind of flush out some of the characters. Uh, I assumed immediately that your favorite part is probably when they go to Emoshu and they meet Boomy. Oh, I love Emoshu and Boomy. But there's a lot of interesting things in here. Katara, by far, is definitely the best character in Season 1. Yes. She has the best character moments and development. Steals from a pirate. (laughs) But there's a lot of other interesting things. But I feel like there is a moment here in season one where Zuko starts becoming the most interesting character. Mm. And that's the Blue Spirit episode. Yes. 100% the Blue Spirit episode. So we get introduced to a new character from the Fire Nation, Admiral Zhao. Yeah. Who or is... Chow, the actual you ask the wrong people. <laughs> the actual villain of the series. Yeah. Uh, season. Of yeah. the season, yeah. So uh, he doesn't know at the time, at the beginning, that the uh, Avatar is alive. But then... Quickly starts to believe that's the case when he sees Zuko in hot pursuit of something. Yeah. And Zhao, unlike uh, Zuko, actually manages to capture Aang and would have succeeded. But Zuko, knowing that his only way to restore honor with his father is to capture the Avatar himself, dresses up as the Blue Spirit with a mask and twin scythes. And infiltrates the fortress and recaptures Aang. Yeah, and Aang ends up deciding to save him as well after... Uh, he gets knocked out. Yeah. By the way, those archers never get used again, but they were clearly effective. They were used again. Oh? Yeah, in the, uh, in the first siege that they do into the Fire Nation during the Eclipse, you can see them scattered here and there throughout the battlefield. Oh, okay. So they all draw attention to it, but like... Why, why did he just give up on these archers when they clearly captured the Avatar yeah, once? I know. <laughs> it's yeah. like, okay, never use them again. Uh, but really, again, it's kind of like stories here and there for the first season. And then really the, the connective story we end up getting is the last mm-hmm. three episodes when they finally get to the Northern uh, Tribe. Although, the, although I don't want to skim over it. I do want to mention it at least. Is one of the first episodes when they first leave the South Pole and one of Sokka's most impactful episodes was when they meet the Kyoshi warriors. Yeah. Yes. Since they come from a small tribe in the South Pole and only men are warriors and the women take care of the household and all that. So Sokka is very much under the impression that men are strong and women should stay at home doing the cleaning and cooking and all that. Yeah, and the big change in Sokka's character kind of happens through the course of season one as well because <laughs> he first meets the Kyoshi warriors, realize... The Kyoshi they're... warriors are all females and they immediately... Beat him face down into the dirt. Yeah. yeah. And he immediately learns respect for them. He's like, okay, women can be fighters too. I've been uh, completely wrong with this outlook of my, my entire life. Yeah, and then the next instance we get is with uh, Yue at the end during the, the Water Tribe siege, where she's the daughter of the leader of the Northern Tribe. 
And we find out that she's actually been blessed by the moon spirit, or one part of it, essentially. And she has a connection to the other world, because we find out that there's these moon spirit fish that kind of give all the water bending power. Yeah, so the moon spirit decided to uh, stay connected with the mortal world. Since the spirit world and the mortal world got separated at some time in the past. Yeah, the moon so spirit specifically chose to stay take, in the mortal world. Take a mortal form and decided to live in a little pond in the North Pole. Yeah. Um, this is also where we get introduced first to the idea of original benders, because when uh, Aang and Katara are brought by Yue to the spirit uh, to the spirit pool, she's not even introducing the fish as the spirits, but she explains the idea that the original waterbender was actually the moon, because the way the moon tugged on the oceans and created the tides uh, mm-hmm. introduced waterbenders to the idea of controlling water. And that's what taught them how to waterbend, was watching the moon. Which, when you learn about some of the other original benders, <laughs> is real fucking sad for the yeah, water yeah, tribe. Yeah, because at this way, it's like, okay, the moon, so does that mean earthbenders, I guess, was like earthquakes or something. Firebenders was a volcano. And airbenders was like a storm, maybe. But no, no, it's goddamn. <laughs> Air, yeah. And the airbenders have the flying bison, which are six-legged bison that can fly. Also, they're extinct. Yes, except for the one that Aang has, because it was frozen in ice. Yep. Uh, there's the dragons, which are going on extinct, and were fire-breathing which, dragons. Which are believed to be extinct by the whole world. Yes, yep. except then, for the two that remain. And then badger moles are the earthbenders? Yes. Yeah. So, waterbenders had to learn by watching the moon. Everyone else got to learn by interacting with fucking mythical beasts that actually shaped the world to their whip. To be fair, I don't think badger moles are a mythical beast within this universe because, as you probably noticed quickly in the series... They're just very aggressive, blind... Fair. Badger moles. Well, no, just all the animals in this are just two different animals combined into one. And their names are literally just the first thing's name followed by the second thing's name. It'd be like lion turtles or, uh, what is it, wasp vultures. (laughs) Yeah, which is... Brings up another amazing point in the second season where they're in the Earth Kingdom and find out that the Earth King has a pet bear. Yep. Just and they're bear. like, what? A turtle bear? No. Platypus bear? No. It just says bear. It's just a bear. Weird. <laughs> it's a weird place. <laughs> Which I guess gets us into what I would say personally is my favorite season, Book 2 Earth. Mm. Introduces probably my favorite character. And honestly, if I had to break up like the three seasons... This is also very much the Empire Strikes Back of Avatar. <laughs> so, I want to jump back a little bit just to the siege of the Water Tribe, because that also introduces us to the idea of different characters having visions of what their future is going to be, because Admiral Zhao, who we've talked about a little bit when he was younger, had a vision of himself killing the uh, Moon Spirit and defeating the Water Tribes in that moment. Uh, well, technically he only had the vision of him killing the Moon Spirit, but believed that to mean he would kill the Moon Spirit and then conquer the Water Tribes immediately afterwards. Uh, and this leads him to start his conquest against them. He finds a book which explains the mortal forms of the Moon Spirit and the Ocean Spirit. And then he breaks into the fucking Northern Water Tribe, kills the Moon Spirit, and he's like, Ha ha! My vision is halfway done, now I just need to conquer it. And then the Moon Spirit's brought back to life, and he's fucking killed and died. Yeah, where Yue was saved by the Moon Spirit. Yeah, she ends up giving her life to bring it back to She life. was stillborn, and her parents brought her to the Moon Spirit. The Moon Spirit imparted some of its energy into her to bring her back to life. So when the Moon Spirit was killed, Yue gave back her life to bring back the Moon Spirit. But and became the Moon. Admiral Shao is not the first character to have a vision of a future and just completely put all of his eggs into that one basket only to realize... He's aggressively misinterpreting the vision <laughs> of his future. Uh, we'll get into the other one in a little bit, mm-hmm. but continuing onwards. Yeah, so uh, definitely this season is the one that feels like it's one large connected season. Like, it does have those short stories here and there, but it feels like there's a constant progress uh, that most of the episodes you kind of have to watch in order, whereas mm-hmm. this first season, and even parts of the second season, I feel like you can watch in whatever order you want, but season two feels like, for the most part, it's just a straight line you kind of have to go through. Yeah. yeah. We get introduced to, which I personally feel is the better big villain of the series, Azula, Zuko's yes. sister. Yep. Who, unlike Zuko, who is actually rational, she's completely insane and cold-blooded. And oh yeah, she's she, she comes off as crazy and cold-blooded, and then season 3, 100% proves this through a few key episodes. Yes. Yeah, to be fair, but Azula she's... also has a character arc. It's just, instead of the normal arc where she grows and improves over the season... 
She has a full-on fucking descent into madness over yeah. the course of the she, two she seasons. She starts off freaking calculated, cold, incredibly intelligent, and scheming, and manipulative. Yeah, and, and this is the season where Zuko, I feel, kind of transforms into the best character in the series. Uh, now, Sokka's had his development, and it's great development, but I feel like he just doesn't meet that requirement of being, like, the probably the best character with mm-hmm. this thing. But, the because the whole thing ends up happening here is, because Zuko and Iroh effectively prevented the Fire Nation from taking over the Water Tribe, they are now branded as traitors, so Azula's actually sent to retrieve them. And then, because <laughs> stupid Admiral of the Boat says, take the prisoners inside, they find out, have a bit of a fight, and escape, so... We actually, for this season, have Zuko and Iroh on the run, <laughs> Well, the rest of the Avatar team is trying to find an Earthbender for Aang. Yes. yes. And when they find a giant swamp, Aang gets a vision of an Earthbender who listens first. Yeah, because even Boomy's like, you, you need a, uh, someone who will wait and listen. <laughs> yes, Boomy said that, and then Aang had the vision of uh, just who it was going to be from a yeah, distance. because originally they were going to have Boomy be his earthbender, but the, it's pretty much Amashu ends up getting taken out just as they get there. Yeah, so they, they, have they to get there, them. they leave, Fire Nation rolls up. Yeah, so they have to get to Ba Sing Se to find another earthbender. Yep. Yeah, so they start making their way to Ba Sing Se. They end up, uh, the other important key point in this sto- uh, arc is that they find the library in the desert as well. Yes. That also tells them that there's a comet coming, and another comet, uh, a solar eclipse coming, and when it happens, firebenders will lose their power. Yes, because yes, as we've already kind of addressed, the uh, waterbenders gain a lot of their power from the moon, so during full moons they're even more powerful. Firebenders get a lot of their power from the sun itself, so at nighttime they're not as powerful. During the day when the sun is in the sky, they're a lot more powerful. And when the Sozin's Comet comes, since it only comes once every hundred years, it brings a lot of power. Uh, whereas during an eclipse, when the sun's power is blocked out, they dramatically reduce like, As in they like, can't. Yes. And the other interesting thing about this is a lot of things happen this season, which I indicate, like, as I said, like, it feels like the Empire Strikes Back, where the uh, characters just keep getting bombarded with such bad things back to back. Yeah. Because Appa gets stolen away, so the last half of the series, they don't have Appa to do the fast travel. They have to do everything by foot, and they're trying to find him. Aang almost murders a bunch of people. <laughs> Yeah, because he is so pissed that his lifelong friend is gone. Yeah. Yeah. And even when they get to uh, Ba Sing Se, it's like there's an internal conflict and the people inside the inner inner walls have no idea there's a war going on. Yeah. Something seems fishy at first because uh, everything's all hunky-dory inside the walls. No one's talking about the war. No one wants to talk about the war. Yeah. The dialect secret police are kind of just controlling everything. Yes. That fucking line when he's meeting with Buddy and he's like, there is no war in Ba Sing Se. It's just like, Holy fuck! Calm the fuck down, yeah, buddy! and this season definitely does take on that darker tone, too. Like, And this just exemplifies more, like, there's bad guys on both sides and good guys on both yeah, sides. So it's not about destroying the Fire Nation, it's about bringing peace. So yeah. You learn in this arc that the secret police are secretly manipulating the Earth King so they can, in essence, run all of Bossing Se. Yeah. And, uh... Eventually, Zuko and I end up working their way into the city, too. Yeah, and Because they, dis- <laughs> they decide, hey... We could never break into the city, so this would be the perfect place for us to hide from the Fire Nation. Yep. And uh, Ira ends up getting his dream of having a tea shop. Because he gets work at a little tea shop, and then some higher, more classy businessman is like, This is the best tea ever. I want you to have your own tea shop in the upper rings. And Uncle Iroh was so overjoyed. So the big conflict of this season is they end up getting Toph on their team, uh, who ends up being the Earthbender. Uh, she's from a rich family, and they have no idea she's a great earthbender. <laughs> they think she's, like, too weak and useless to do anything, so she's just being protected all the time. Yeah, one day she found herself lost in a cave and got to interact with the Badramals and learned how to bend from them. And another detail that's never mentioned in the show, but you can tell if you pay attention to the stylings, Toph's movements when she's earthbending are a lot different when compared to all the other earthbenders you see. Because she learned from an original bender, the yeah. Badramals. And because she's blind... Her earthbending is based off of a southern praying mantis style kind of thing. So the movements are a lot closer into the body, a lot more shorter footwork, steady stances, very quick motions and guarded. And to be fair, introduced in a wrestling arena. Yes. To be fair, that 100% fucking works out for her because she is easily the most powerful earthbender 
of the time in that she fucking straight up invents a new form of bending in metal bending. No one else had fucking done that. And she's just like, yeah, of course, metal yeah, bending. Because how the season ends up going is the Daily make a play and Aang and his party have to defeat them. They end up finding out where Appa is and Zuko ends up having to make the choice of killing Appa or freeing Appa, which is kind of where his character art of like the, the inner conflict starts to come to an end. Mm -hmm. And when he does that, he actually gets incredibly sick and ill because, as Uncle Iroh puts it, his two internal selves are at war with each other. <laughs> Uchi's all fucked up. Yeah. Uh, but they end up defeating the Dai Li, and the Emperor ends up signing with them, which I love how they convince him. It's like, no, I've never seen an air bison in my life. It's like, oh yeah? Well, look at his leg. That's a bite mark from an air bison. Eh, that's definitely a bite, so that proves he's seen one, but that doesn't prove you're right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but they take him to the wall because there was a fight there. I should also mention that we had two new characters introduced with Azula, who is kind of like the ongoing force through it. We have Mei and Tai Li. Yes. Tai Li is kind of a circus girl who has pressure points, which can stop bending. And Mei is just a gloomy girl who's depressed about everything, but she throws and ninja stars. Also, Zuko's girlfriend. Yeah. Yeah. Kind of. Uh, but they're definitely a fun dynamic together. Uh, and eventually, when they end up taking over the city, uh, well, they save the city of Ba Sing Se, they think, oh, it's safe, but we all have to split because Aang is going to go to a guru to learn about the cheese and unlock the them. inner chakras to Sokka knows control his avatar state. Yeah. Sokka knows where his father is, and he's going to go off to join them. Uh, Toph is going to meet with her mother finally, and then uh, Kitara is going to stay in the city and help with the war effort. Because they received a message, or Toph received a message saying that her family has come to uh, accept her decision in leaving and wants to support her and see her again. Because yeah. she just kind of left without saying, and they kind of assumed that the Avatar kidnapped her. And then this, oh, the, you have Kyoshi warriors here. Oh, so they're friends of ours. You can trust them. And it's actually Azula who had defeated the Kyoshi warriors, and they're pretending to be them to take the city over. Yeah. Because she ends up being the first fire... Like, oh, I think she's the only person who actually defeated Ba Sing Se and, like, took it over up yeah, to Yeah, she's point. the only yeah. one who actually got inside the city and infiltrated. Yeah, she just takes over the city. Well... I let's let's the, discuss Iroh's past right now. The, the, the first firebenders to get into the city were Iroh and Zuko. Well, to be fair, they only get through the outer wall. True. We should also discuss Iroh's actual initial campaign, where he sieged uh, Ba Sing Se, managed to break through the walls, but his son, who was fighting as a part of his army, fucking dies on the front line, and Iroh's immediately like, what have I been doing? Why have I been focusing on this? And immediately just fucking hoofs it back to fucking... Fire Nation. Because he just suddenly comes to the realization that family is a lot more important. Uh, and shortly after that day, he starts seeing Zuko as his own son and not just his nephew. Um, this also is what leads to Fire Lord Ozai becoming the Fire Lord. Because up until that point, he was the younger brother and thus not in line for the throne. Uh, Which, thinking about if Iroh was the Fire Lord, that's like, <laughs> the world would be so goddamn different in oh, this universe. Yes. Uh, but I love the fucking plotline that happens here. Because fucking Fire Lord Ozai goes up to their father. I forget what the father's name is. Azulon. He, Azulon. Yeah. And he's like, hey, Pops, uh, Iroh over there doesn't have a son anymore. He shouldn't be the Fire Lord after you. He has no one to pass the role on to. And Azulon's like, what the goddamn fuck is wrong with you? He lost his son and you're pulling this kind of shit? My, the only reasonable punishment is you have to go kill your firstborn <laughs> son right now. It's the only way to make up for this and fucking you can, you sin. You can only imagine he was like, yeah, sure. Yeah. He was <laughs> no like, hesitation. Like, no, father. We think like, yeah, sure. Why not? It's Zuko. He yeah. fucked up earlier. He was 100% on board with fucking killing Zuko. And then fucking Zuko's mom was like, how about this? We make a deal. I'll give you the poison to kill your father. You could take over the role yourself. Mm -hmm. In exchange, you do not kill my goddamn son. And I was, I was like, yeah, sure. And that's yeah, how sure, he became I, Fire I Lord. Won't kill him. I'll just keep putting him in situations where the Avatar will probably kill I'll him. I'll just horribly <laughs> scar him for life and kick him out of the Fire Nation. <laughs> I'm going to egg Nikai him in the face multiple times, leave a bad scar, but I'm not going to kill him. Then he's banished. Still yeah. alive, though. Still alive. Great times. He'll, he'll thank me for it later. Uh, but essentially, this is where, uh, like, the big... F I feel like they, if they would have took Season uh, 2 and ended it with all of them being separated and then Azula just taking over the Earth Kingdom, that would have been such an amazing ending. Yeah. And then I feel like it could have also fixed Season 3 a bit for what my problems were with it. But the season continues. Uh, Toph invents metal bending at the same time the Guru's, the Guru's talking about how the elements aren't uh, flat, just there's four elements that you bend. Everything is the elements and they're all parts of the elements. 
So mm -hmm. hypothetically, this also opens up the door in the future to kind of like duo bending, I guess, where you can like, uh, for example, uh, we see multiple times where Toph and Katara work together to bend mud. Yeah. And separate it. So we could see that potentially is what he's getting at. But essentially, the Avatar decides, I need to go back and save Katara. I can't stay here to do my bending uh, training or my Avatar state training. Get right, Sokka. Katara stayed back in uh, Bossing City. Immediately gives all the... First off, the Earth King gives like, Oh, we just found out about this solar eclipse. It's going to fuck up the Earth and the Fire Nation. She's like, yeah. oh, that's very interesting. Well, I think immediately telling their plans of an invasion to the Fire Nation. Lovely. I think it's also important to mention, because you were talking about how the guy was explaining how bending isn't as rigid as people think. I think it also stands to reason that, like, for hundreds of fucking years before this happened, earthbending was really just limited to earthbending. Firebending was really just limited to firebending. Waterbending was really just limited to waterbending. And then over the span of the hundred years since the Fire Nation attacked... The firebenders start bending fucking lightning as the more powerful. Actually, I, I think Sozin used lightning. Yeah, Sozin might have used lightning, but it becomes a more common thing that happens. The waterbenders start bending fucking blood, and the earthbender invents fucking metal bending. So clearly, people just weren't fucking innovating, and all it took was a war that was a hundred years long for people to start innovating the bending. The only downside is they fucking killed off the airbenders. Otherwise, who knows what kind of shit they would have come up with? Actually, we do find out what they came up with. And Legend of Korra, and I do have some problems with that, but... That's well, I haven't seen day. Legend of Korra, so it didn't happen in my book. Uh, but, as I was saying, they all end up coming back together to the Earth Kingdom to do the final showdown with Azula. This is where Zuko ends up captured because he's too stubborn. He's like, no, I'm not running from Azula anymore. I challenge you to an Igna Kai. She's like, no, and just captures him. Yep. Uh, but him and Katara kind of have, like, a moment where you see, like, oh, Zuko's changing... And this is where, like, I guess the actual big twist end that they decided for season two was going to be was Aang decides to move beyond his connections to the earthly realm to open up his final uh, chakra to become the full Avatar state. And Azula essentially pulls the op, uh, the uh, you know how normally the villain makes a speech and you let them have their speech. Well, you get to see what happens on the opposite side of that, where the hero's making a speech and the villain doesn't want to wait just fucking ball. zaps him in the middle of transformation. Yep. Yeah. But Zuka ends up turning on. Uh, the after sides with Azula, and it's like, oh, okay, he's full on villain now, I guess. Uh, they kill the Avatar, yeah, so but Katara Aang, has magic water. Yeah, Aang and Katara are uh, pitted against Azula, Zuko, and all of the Dai Li agents who are now working for Azula. Yeah, which her like when the Dai Li main guy comes in, is like, this is the part where I double cross you, uh, apprehend her, and they don't move. It's like, oh, they're waiting, waiting for what to see who wins between the two of us because they're more scared of me than they are of you. Which, uh, being scared of Azula is a plot point that actually comes up a few times, which I really enjoy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But this season effectively ends with the world believing Aang is dead, and the Earth Kingdom has fallen, so the war is over, and the Fire Nation has won effectively at this point. Yeah. And Aang would technically have died, if not for the fact that Katara had a little bit of special water from the North Pole where the Moon Spirit resides. Yeah, in the oasis where the Moon Spirit resided. She... Now, here's the question I have, though, because we get information this season that when you die in the avatar state it kills not just you but every avatar state beforehand and ends the cycle of reincarnation yeah, it just ends the cycle so there's not going to be any more avatars but Aang clearly dies in the avatar state but they do bring him back does that mean like technically no. it should mean that the avatar state ended but Aang didn't no because the whole thing isn't that the avatar state ends it's just that he won't be reborn but since he didn't die, the Avatar state gets to continue. Oh, because the, the wording of it might have been weird, because it sounds like if you die in the Avatar state, it wipes out not just you, but every Avatar pre previous and stops the reincarnation. Yeah, the, the symbolism that they used when uh, the spirit of Avatar Roku, the previous Avatar, when he was explaining the whole thing to Aang, the symbolism didn't really match what he said, but yeah, it's kind of... If you die in the Avatar state, there won't be any more Avatars. You end the line there. Oh. Yeah, I definitely interpreted it that way because I also interpreted it as, like, the Avatar state might allow you to call on the other Avatars as we see him do later on in the series. But, like, I still feel like the spirits of the Avatars who came before are their own separate entity from the Avatar. Yeah. Because when he goes to the spirit realm, he's able to talk with Avatar Roku, which, if he's just a part of his spirit, shouldn't have come through yeah. with him like and that. Even... 
towards the end of the series, he's able to talk with other previous avatars also. Well, yeah. I think the, the uh, indication of how the avatar system works is they're all the same person, but when you die, it kind of like saves that instance of it. So when they're talking to them themselves in spirit form, it's not really a ghost that they're finding and meeting with. It's the spirits within them. Yeah, and it's a different form of themselves. Essentially. So they yeah. still have their will and their thoughts as their own independent avatar, but they're within Aang. And yeah, I know. So much. Uh, I accept that. I just feel like they also have their own separate spirit because of the fact that when Aang went to the spirit realm to try and find the moon spirit and the ocean spirit, he interacted with a separate spirit in the form of Av- uh, Avatar Roku uh, in the spirit world and not just interacting with himself or pulling Roku out of himself. Yeah. Roku was just a separate being inside the spirit realm. Yeah, and the only mm-hmm. indication we get of like, really, the, the strength of them being the same person as the Avatar is Aang's airbending master. Because we find out that Roku was also friends with him. But then I'll just raise the question of, well, did Roku just take special care of Aang because he was the Avatar, which is the next step of Roku, his best friend? Or was it because they just felt that connection where, as Roku puts it, some bonds go beyond lifetimes? Yeah. Because, like, as we learn, Roku was a friend of Monk Gyatso, and Aang immediately became a friend of Monk Gyatso. Yeah. And... Part of the test of who is the Avatar is to select four toys out of a pile of hundreds of toys. And the Avatar always selects the exact same four toys, no matter who it is, when they're born. Yeah, because they have connections to the same things that the Avatar who came before them had connection, which would make sense as to why he immediately took a liking to Monkey Atsu, because of the fact that the Avatar before him had taken a liking to Monkey Yeah, so I guess it's... The way to look at it is like it's either some part of the spirits being transferred forward, mm-hmm. which is creating the chain... Or it could be something like an instinct that's passed on with the memories yeah. of the previous one. So you instinctually go towards things they remember, which is why he was so good friends with the monk and the toys and all that stuff. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So anyways. Yeah. So on to book three. Now, before we get to book three, there's one other thing I want to mention. Because okay. I did mention earlier something in my memory that happened but didn't really happen. Oh. So in season two, there's a part where they get into a fight with Azula. And it's the Avatar characters, Iroh and Zuko, all have her cornered. And she just fucking zaps Iroh. Yeah. I was positive he died at this part. Really? No. Yeah. I was positive Iroh was dead for the rest of the no. series in my memory. It's like, uh, I can't, like, I was sitting there, it's like, and he lived. I'm like, oh, it must have been later in the series he died. And I was just sitting there, it's like, man, it's going to be so sad when Iroh dies. <laughs> <laughs> no, the whole point is that's when you realize that lightning redirection is a fucking thing. No, but like, I don't know how I got that in my mind, because I thought like what ends up happening is Azula ends up killing Iroh at some point in the season, and that's what... Zuko essentially turns his back on the Fire Nation to help Aang. That was, in my mind, what happened. Oh, no, no. <laughs> no. Because, uh, as we mentioned there, when we get into book three, Zuko is clearly on the fire side. And yeah, I, uh, my first time watching this, I was positive. This was just building up to, it was going to be a 4v4 of Zuko and the Firebenders versus Aang's team. Each of them were going to have to face up against one person hmm. for the big final. Because I want to say, I'm just going to say it right now. The current Fire Lord is nothing to me in this story. He has no impact. He's just there to burn something down. I feel no threat from this man. Yeah, because all we get is that he is... Well, the they make a point of not even showing his fucking face until... Yeah, he's like, some faceless villain that we know is this series is just evil force. Yeah, He's not even responsible for the war that's ongoing. That was started by his grandfather. Yeah. And even the idea to burn down Ba Sing Se isn't his. He's just like, hmm, that is a good idea. That's, yeah, it's literally that's Azula's. Yeah, it's idea. Azula reinterpreting what fucking Zuko says, and he's just like, yeah, fuck it, let's do it. You know what could have made this so much better? Having it set up that he's going to be the person, and he wrongs Azula just one too many times, and Azula just fucking kills him, and then mm. she's the Fire Lord, and like, now I'm going to burn down Ba Sing Se. That would have been the great like setup of actually having some you know history with the villain, because at this point. The thing that solidified to me that Azula is just crazy was the beach episode, funny enough. Yeah. The beach yeah. episode was like, Azula, okay, Azula's just crazy. We ought to leave. Oh, 100%. But the Fire Lord just has no... I felt nothing at him being the villain or being defeated. But Azula and versus Zuko and Katara, that was like the big final for me. But no, I feel the direction that they approached it is also fine because Fire Lord Ozai is just depicted through the whole series as just pure evil. He's a villain that needs to be stopped at all costs. Yeah. And the whole confrontation at the end, the whole conflict, the internal conflict that Aang has with himself, kind of adds to that. Well, the thing to imagine here, too, is, say that twist ends happening, Azula kills him. Mm -hmm. We also have the background where Aang's struggle to kill the person or not becomes all that more serious because 
in my mind, it could have been way better if they killed off Iroh and then also. So I am making some stuff up here. What yeah. could happen? But if say she kills Iroh, she kills the father, and then Aang has to make the decision of this person is clearly beyond saving, mm. but I don't want to kill them because all life is precious. And that struggle is a whole lot more serious than just, I just don't feel like killing. And all the Avatar is like, you gotta kill the guy. Yeah. And it's like, I don't want it though. It's just the way it is, is that the whole world outside of the Fire Nation hates Ozai, and everyone expects Avatar Aang to kill, kill Ozai. Yeah. yeah. Just because of that. The whole world doesn't know about Azula. Yeah. But, um, uh, yeah, so book three starts, and Zuko is happy. He's got the family back that he wants in the Fire Nation. But he starts to realize that it's not everything that he wanted, and he starts to realize that Uncle Iroh, as we've already mentioned, was more of a father figure to him than uh, well, Ozai. Ozai was. Shithead Ozai. Yeah. And uh, I would say, season two got dark, but this is definitely the darkest season. Yes. Mm-hmm. I mean, there's a literal eclipse. Come on. <laughs> yeah. And so, it starts off with Zuko coming to that realization, and... The first few episodes are leading up to the eclipse and the invasion of the Fire Nation. And so that happens when the invasion happens. Zuko takes this moment where Ozai can't firebend to confront his father directly, say, I'm going to go side with the Avatar because he's still alive. And this is another part where uh, I was saying season two seems more connected than season three. Mm -hmm. Because there doesn't seem to be any real connection aside from they're wasting time until the invasion day, yeah. which is kind of just ruins the opening of season three because it could have been so much stronger. And because they do this, yeah, there's some important parts uh, that end up happening, like uh, Sokka getting his trainer and the characters getting that recap as well as saving Suki, mm-hmm. uh, which are all important things for the story going forward. But everything up to the invasion feels like it could have been easily shortened up to start off with, oh, the invasion's in a couple of days. They get there, have the struggle. And then I feel like they could have built up the struggle at the end, as well as the climax, a little bit better. Because it feels like, even though they kind of have something there to explain Aang's power uh, to take away the uh, bending from mm. uh, the Fire Lord, it still feels very deus ex machina because it wasn't really mentioned at any point and just kind of shows up in the last two episodes. It's fair. It does feel kind of deus ex machina, deus ex machina. But they do, I feel at the very least, that they go out of their way to explain why it feels that way by introducing the fact that, like, it was what the land turtles used first, and they should have just didn't give it to people, humanity, because they thought it was too powerful. And now they're giving it to him because they recognize that he has the capacity to wield the power in a smart and safe way. And the fact that it can only be wielded by the Avatar because you need to have the ability to wield all four elements, and you also need to have... The, the pure heart. The strength of will and mm-hmm. the pure heart to do it. Yeah, and I, I don't say, like, it's not that I have a problem with them explaining how it needs to work and I get to that point, but I feel like they just dropped it so late in the game that it felt weird to have that be the ultimate, like, defeating tool. I, I get what you're saying. I also kind of understand why they didn't explain it before, because watching those final four episodes where Aang's just completely conflicted about the fact that Ozai needs to not be able to bend anymore because if he still has the power to bend, there's no way they can contain him and he will continue to be a problem for all of humanity. So he, they kind of build up this conflict and they kind of build up the tension of does he kill Ozai or does he allow Ozai to continue killing other people? Uh, to the point where like even in the final episode when he fucking corners Ozai and incapacitates him and is about to go for the killer blow and then turns his fucking back on him. And Ozai's like sitting there crippled and he's like, even with all that power, you're still so fucking weak, except well, I don't think he swears. It, it wasn't that he turned his back on it. It was he w- had the dead to rights send the electric back to him and then fired it off to the sky. Yeah. But yeah, Ozai's just like, even with all that power, you're still so weak. It's like that moment of like, fuck, Aang's choosing not to kill him. If they hadn't revealed that Enderidge bending was a thing he had in his back pocket this entire time, there wouldn't have been any conflict in all this because you knew Aang was just building up to energy bending Ozai, you mm-hmm. knew that there was never any threat of him having to deal with the conflict of whether he kills or not, because of course he doesn't kill. He has the alternative of not killing, but taking away bending. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But yeah, as you briefly mentioned at the start of book three, I want to bring up one of my favorite episodes, is when Sokka found his own master. Because uh, Aang had his own masters to his bending, Katara found a bending water master, and Sokka never had his own master, so the others decide, you need to find yourself a master. And so he finds himself a sword master to teach him uh, swordsmanship in the Fire Nation. The space sword. Yes. 
Which that... he loses, sadly. <laughs> yeah. yeah, he does, sadly. That was a really cool sword. So, to be fair, he loses it saving himself and Suki, so it's entirely fucking justified. Or not yeah. Suki. Toph. Him and Toph. Yeah. Suki but, um, then saves them a couple seconds later. Yeah, they do yeah. set up a few times where it looks like, is this the end of the characters? Uh, just to have them, you know, mm-hmm. saved at the last minute. But yeah, um, uh, but that whole uh, Swordmaster Teacher episode starts off with a meteor falling to uh, Earth and them saving the town that was nearby from the fire spreading from the meteorite. And, uh, and then, of course, in the town, there's a Swordmaster that uh, Sokka goes and finds. And we also, when he's learning swordsmanship, we also start to learn, or at the end of the episode anyway, when uh, the Swordmaster reveals that he knew that Aang was the Avatar the entire time and Sokka and his friends were not Fire Nation. He kind of inadvertently reveals that there is another organization in the Fire Nation. The it, White Lotus. The White Lotus. Well, it's not the Fire well, Nation. It's they, all around. Yeah, yeah. They expand all nations. The old people group, as it's later introduced. Yeah. How do you guys know each other? We're old people. We all know each other. All old people know each other. Yeah. So it's a secret organization working from the shadows to assist the Avatar and peace also. And some of the members, Boomy from the Earth Nation, Iroh from the Fire Nation, the Swordmaster from the Fire Nation, uh, another, the first fire bending teacher that Aang had in the series from the Fire Nation. And uh, the... Um, and Paku, the leader of the Northern Water Tribe. Yes. Who is now uh, Katara and Sokka's uh, grandfather. <laughs> yep. Man, not to be wrong, like, even though I feel like season three was weak compared to season two, it still had a lot of great moments. Uh, one of the best moments definitely has to be when they go to see the play of their life, which is yes. a neat way to do a recap episode before the series ends it's as well. It's the Fire Nation's take on their story thus far. I do love how they get to, like, up to now in the story... And, like, the group starts, like, standing up, like, ah, play's over. But then it keeps coming, like, what? Is this the future? <laughs> and then it just features Azula fucking murking uh, Zuko and then Fire Lord Ozai just killing the shit out Which of the Which is funny because that is how it gets split up, too. So they kind of did predict the future, just the outcome was a bit different. Yeah. yeah. But the, the funny things in this is there's a lot of, like, things that it also makes fun of itself with. Uh, obviously there's the part where all the characters are kind of upset and like, do I really sound like that? Yeah, and like then the top Katara, of you. Katara is depicted as a very overdramatic woman. Yeah. Sokka oh. depicted as a very unfunny guy, and Sokka's annoyed that his jokes are yeah. unfunny. And the, the top Aang is played by a woman. <laughs> but the top one where it comes out, it's like, silly uh, airbender, you can't out. find an earthbender in the air. You have to look in the earth! And it's just a big jacked dude. <laughs> where Toph is just a little blind girl. It's like, yeah. my name is Toph, because it sounds like Toph. But the best part of this, too, is because at this point, uh, she uh, Toph was like, you guys are getting too upset about this. It's just so accurate. And then Katara's like, huh, it's uh, pretty accurate, huh? And it's like, what are you talking about? This is amazing. <laughs> they perfectly cast me. Yeah. Uh, the other part that I love from this flashback, because it's something I even forget about, was a part where they're doing the uh, bossing safe fight again, yeah. where Jet dies. <laughs> Or dies, quotation marks. Oh, yeah. And it's like, he says, like, oh, go on without me. And then it's like, wait, did Jet just die? And then it's like, it's like it was kind of unclear. <laughs> <laughs> so this does bring up one of the issues I had with the season, uh, which is Katara. I kind of got real annoyed with Katara just because of the fact that, like, they have this whole will-they-won't-they they moment during the fucking bossing to say shit between Aang and Katara. And, like, it's clear that Aang has feelings for Katara. And Katara seems to kind of match those feelings, at least in some ways, but is a little bit unsure. Then fucking Zuko shows up, and Katara's fucking all over Zuko, to the point where the people in the play make fun of it. And she keeps referring to Aang as, like, her good friend or her little brother. But then, like, starts confessing her love to Zuko. And then Katara does not reciprocate any feelings for Aang until Zuko gets fucking married to mine. And then she turns to Aang and she's like, Eh, hey, what's up, buddy? It's just like... Man, you're such a gold digging. But to be fair, I, that's not how I interpret it at all. In fact, I found Aang the annoying part in this whole situation, too. Especially, like, is that what you think? Just like you said, it's like, that wasn't play, Aang. <laughs> was like, that's not what I think at all. Because I, I... Definitely there was, like, I could see them trying to set up, like, possibly trying to hint at, like, there might be a triangle here going. But I never once thought, like, it was an actual thing. Yeah. Katara and... liking Aang was just... She just didn't want to do anything with a war going on. Which yeah. is a good thing. There's more important things going on, Aang. I know, it's just... I found it funny how she refused to take any steps until fucking yeah. Zuko was married off to fucking Mai. Uh, also, when uh, Mei does the uh, or twist uh, or turn on uh, Azula at the prison thing, where mm-hmm. she ends up saving Zuko, and when Azula's just like, about to completely murder her, and then Tylee's like, oh, fuck it. 
Yeah. Uh, Which starts Azula down a much of it in yeah, more insane path than you think. Because her best friends just betrayed her, so she can't trust anyone. So now. she just starts firing everyone. Yeah, literally, she calls in the fucking palace guards, and they show up five minutes later, and she's like, How long has it been? She's like, oh, I, We came as soon as we can. It's only been a few minutes. And she's like, Yeah, it's been five minutes, during which time an assassin could have fucking killed me and ran away. You're banished. Leave the Fire Nation forever. <laughs> With the two old ladies, when she banishes one of them but gets the name wrong, it's like, Wait, but I'm Lee. Which one of us is banished? <laughs> yeah. I want you both to egg me kind of to the death. We're not firebenders. Hmm. In that case, you're banished, Lee. So yeah, uh, Azula goes fucking nuts. Uh, yeah, and that's when we get our two big showdowns. Uh, but before we get to the showdowns part, I want to talk about which I think is the strongest scene in the whole series, which is in season three. And that is when Zuko and Iroh get re- reconnected. Yes. yes that I is fucking the scene. bawled my eyes out. Yeah. Uh, just like the moment of like Zuko kneeling out in front of Iroh's tent and Katara walking up and like, What's going on? Aren't you going to go in? He's like, no, he's going to be furious at me. I need to, like, prepare myself for this. And then he goes in and he starts, like, pre- saying his apology only to realize that Ira is fucking out cold. Yeah. So he just kneels next to fucking Ira the entire time he's asleep. And then Ira eventually, once morning comes, wakes up. Notices Zuko out of the corner of his eye, but doesn't say shit. Zuko starts fucking apologizing again and explaining how it's the worst mistake he's ever made. And fucking Iroh just cuts him off in a fucking bear hug. And he explains, like... And Zuko's like, what? Aren't you mad? You should be furious. And he's like, I wasn't mad. I was just worried that you had lost like, your path. I was just scared that you'd lost your way. And I'm just so happy that you finally yeah. found it again. Which, uh, just, this also just goes into the fact that, like, Zuko is clearly the strongest, like, narrative character within the story. Mm-hmm. Just, like, that's the payoff to Zuko's thing. And that's mm-hmm. probably the most emotional feeling I've gotten through any of the things that happened in the oh season. Oh yeah, I this fucking bawled during that scene. Because his whole arc went from him just seeking to redeem himself in the eyes of his father to realizing that what his father in the Fire Nation is doing is wrong. Like, to uh, yeah, coming you... along to uh, his uncle's way of thinking and realizing that he needs to help the Avatar. So, in that... this way... Pulling a whole 180 from where he was at the beginning of the show, and then working towards becoming the new Fire Lord. Yeah, his whole... Like, the scene where he explains why he turned against the Fire Lord, and, like, he's explaining about how they have to stop him before the f- comet. They can't wait till after the comet, because the Fire Lord's going to use the comet to destroy Ba Sing Se, and he's explaining, like, I was back in the Fire Lord's good graces, I was called to a secret uh, military meeting, it was the one thing I'd been waiting for my entire life, and I'm like, yes, that is... Very clearly what the early Zuko had been hoping for his entire life. But then he explains the fact that, like, they're talking about subjecting the, uh, sending more troops after the comet comes into Ba Sing Se to try and quell the rebellions. And he's like, Zuko, what do you think? You spent some time in Ba Sing Se. And it's like, they're very proud and brave people. There's nothing that will cause them, uh, nothing that will break their spirits and cause them to give up. And so it's like, we should just burn that entire land to the dead. And Zuko's like, that's not what I was trying to fucking say. <laughs> and as I was like, yeah, you're right, Zuko. We're doing uh, we're doing Azula's thing. We're burning the nation to the ground. And Zuko's like, yeah, I gotta get the fuck out of here. This is not what I was thinking when I was yeah. picturing this my entire life. And another thing worth mentioning, too, here, too, uh, is that when the comet comes and they do the attack and they're winning, this scene also shows how big of a threat Azula is because she doesn't have firebending. And she's just going to town on the invading team. Yeah. yeah. But yeah, so we see that whole fucking breakdown. And it's just like, if this scene had happened in season one with all of Zuko's uh, beliefs and preferences, there's no fucking way he wouldn't have been immediately on board with burning bossing saying oh, to definitely. the ground. But the fact that he's had that growth and has that moment of realization of, oh... We're, we're the, the bad, bad guys. guys. I didn't realize till now, but we're the bad guys. I, and I should be helping the Avatar. <laughs> and he fucks off to go help the Avatar. It's... Such a beautiful moment, which is paid off by his, like, meeting with Iroh, and Iroh just like, I'm so glad you found your mm-hmm. way back to me. Uh, another uh, Zuko moment I want to talk about, which is probably one of my favorite, well, it's kind of a Zuko and Aang moment, it's where Zuko forgets how, like, he loses his ability to firebend. Because up until then, his purpose, his drive, was his rage and his desire to find the Avatar. Yeah. So with that, uh, able to, you but know, he's not chasing him anymore, so he lost that drive. He, he needs to find and he him. doesn't have his anger anymore, so he doesn't have any... I guess, fuel for his bending. Yeah. But the best part about this is when they end up getting there, find out it's the last two dragons. Iroh lied. He didn't kill one. He learned from them. But then the thing is when they're talking to the Sun Warriors at the end, and it's like, and now that you uh, know all this stuff, you can never leave this place again. I'm just joking, but seriously, don't tell anybody. <laughs> <laughs> and that huge zoom in on his face. Yeah. Perfect. But yeah, uh, 
as we already mentioned, Aang fights off against the Fire Lord, defeats him. But we also get the other fight, which is uh, Zuko shows up at the last moment before uh, Zula is crowned Fire Lord, and they have the fight with Well, Katara. first, before that, we get a little bit where Zuko is training with Aang, teaching Aang firebending, and Aang and the others just start to goof off, and Zuko goes ballistic, because uh, the others didn't... Uh, Realize the deadline that they had in front of them. We're just going to fight him after the comet. We're, Aang's not nearly strong enough to yeah. fight him before, and the world's already as fucked as it yeah, can. They didn't let Zuko know that they planned to wait until after the comet, but then Zuko didn't tell them that uh, he was going to burn Bossing Se and the rest of the world down to the ground with the comet. Yeah. Uh, so he, so that... Aang is immediately panicked because all of a sudden he's like, okay, this has to happen now, and I have to go and kill. The Fire Lord, despite the fact that I've been raised as an air nomad and to value all life and never kill anyone. So far that he's a full-on fucking vegetarian. Would never fucking harm yeah. an animal in his life. So, as he did in the past, he ran away at night. Well, well I don't uh, think... It, the way it was really. interpreted, he didn't really run away. He was more so spiritually pulled to the lion yeah. turtle. He kind of had a kind of sleepwalking awake call. Yeah, the lion turtle took him to the final fight place, gave him the powers, and sent him on his way. Yeah, I do of. really enjoy that scene where he's on the lion turtle, though, and he's talking to the previous avatars in spirit form, and, mm. like, getting their perspective, and they're all like, nah, you gotta knuckle down and straight up kill a bitch. Not quite. When I remembered that scene before, I was like, yeah, they're all telling him to kill him. But when I rewatched that scene, I was like, none of them are explicitly saying kill him. Yeah. They're all just saying... To, that he has to be stopped. Yeah, Roka's like, and you need to be decisive. Uh, it's like you have Kyoshi was like, like you, you have, have to, to do what's necessary. Yeah, it's like justice. You have to be just. Uh, the waterbending guy is like, you have to have an active role in shaping the future. Mm -hmm. And the other airbender says, it's not about what you want, it's about what the world needs. Well, to be fair, she may not explicitly say kill, like, but have, he says... He says been, you have to let go of what you've been taught. Well, she he also says, I can't kill... The way I was raised in Air Nomads, I believe that killing would be to sacrifice my soul and I need to preserve my spirit. And the that's your duty. Yeah, uh, and she explicitly says, she doesn't say the words you have to kill him, but she says uh, you have to sacrifice your soul for the people. Mm -hmm. You can't be selfish and protect your soul by not killing. You have to sacrifice your soul in order to save the greater good. They you're, have their, uh, yeah. you're the avatar first in an air nomad you, They have their duty, but your duty is to this plane. Yeah. yeah. It's like, sure, you can certainly see that they all think that... Well, you can see that all of them would be fine with killing the avatar, or with the Fire Lord, but they don't overtly say it. I so, think it is definitely implied, because oh, yeah. energy bending was not an option that was presented to any mm -hmm. of them. Aang was the first energy bender after the Lion yeah, Turtles. because it was after that where he spoke with the Lion Turtle, and the Lion Turtle told him that the original form of bending was bending the energy itself, and showed him how to bend energy. And thus, he was left on the point of land to confront Ozai when he showed up. So yes, Aang is dropped at the point of land right where Ozai and the other air ships are going to make land. Mm -hmm. Uh... Perfectly positioned to stop Ozai. Yeah. And meanwhile, while this is all happening for Aang, back in the Fire Nation, Ozai's getting ready for his trip, and Azula's all happy to be coming along, because she proposed the plan, she expects to be coming along, like the good little princess she is. And uh, Ozai's like, no, you're staying here, because you're going to be the new Fire Lord starting now. I'm going to be the Phoenix King and rule over the world, baby. What a badass title to give yourself when you're absolutely a fucking mortal who will die and not be reborn as another phoenix. <laughs> uh, but yeah, so that all fucking happens. So, yeah, Azula really starts spiraling into insanity at this point. I do want to touch... So we touched on what was probably the most emotional moment in this series. I want to talk about what I think was the most badass fucking moment in this series, which is... As fucking Ozai's airship is pulling towards where Aang is, and he starts shooting out the fucking torrent of flames, and Aang just turns to Momo, who's sitting on his shoulder, and he's like, it's time for you to leave, Momo. <laughs> that fucking moment where he's like just like, fully prepared to fucking chuck down with fucking Ozai. Yeah. yeah that's Badass. Something, something that the series did really well was showing the progression of the power of the characters. Mm -hmm. yeah. They definitely seemed really weak at the beginning, and it, you can miss it because they have a good growth pace. Pace. But if you look at, just watch, say, the first couple episodes, and watch the last few episodes, there's a world of difference. Yeah. Yeah. 
And especially uh, the fight between Zuko and Azula. That's another very intense moment. But intense for different reasons. Because like, all of the different fight scenes throughout the series have very high-energy music accompanying them. Whereas this one has a track called The Final Agni Kai, which is a very quiet, slow, deliberate song. Well, it fits for fucking Azula being the one you're fighting against. Because quiet doesn't quite fit her, but deliberate absolutely fits a lot of her action mm-hmm. so far. And just the way that fight is depicted is such a huge... I guess the entirety of it is good symbology of good versus evil. If you take into kind of consideration Zuko's like reddish orange fire to be good, Azula's cold blue fire to be evil, that kind of thing, just constantly clashing in that whole plaza. Yeah, uh, we even get to the point where like Azula full on fucking uh, declares one on one combat with Zuko, knowing that she can't possibly take on Zuko and Katara at the same time, and Zuko's like, I accept it. Katara's like, No, fucking don't do that. She's only trying to separate us. And then fucking Zuko's like, no, don't worry, I got this. She's slipping. I got this, bitch. Like, Something she's... seems off about yeah. her. Maybe she's twitching over there. Yeah, and then Azula, being the bitch that she is, realizes she's not beating Zuko one-on-one because he's got grown more powerful as a firebender. And it's just like, oh, we were doing one-on-one combat? Well, while you're distracted, I'm going to shoot some lightning at your girlfriend, Katara, even though you're not actually dating. And it's just like, man, fuck you, Azula. Yeah. Well, she was going to shoot Zuko, but... Because Zuko's like, come on, shoot lightning or something. I'll just redirect I'm it. pretty good at the redirection thing. And he's got, like, the finger guns prepared for the redirection. <laughs> and she's like, you know what? Fine, I'll do it. And then she's like, oh, but her. She can't do that. And so Zuko dives over to try and block it. But he isn't positioned well to redirect. So he just fucking takes lightning to the chest. Kind of gets hurt a little bit. A little bit. And then Katara takes over and fucking wrecks shop with Azula. More kind of lures her over. Uh, and then wrecks shop. Water. Yeah. And then freezes her in a block of ice and chains and her up. Systematically melts the ice in such a way that she can wrap her in chains and incapacitate her. And Azula is subdued and chained up like the beast she is. And then Aang has his fight with uh, Ozai. It goes on for a while of Ozai just fucking flinging fireball after fireball at Aang. Aang just taking them like a champ, blocking them at the last second with all of the different yeah. elements. But then Ozai starts to get the upper hand, pushes Aang back into a corner, Aang's avatar state is tripped, and... And he wrecks Shaw. Absolutely obliterating, sending Ozai on the run. And then this is when he gets to the point... So, there was the lightning redirection earlier, which he does before entering the avatar state, and he's going to send it back, and Ozai realizes that Mike Killman doesn't want to do it, Mm -hmm. so he shoots it into the air. And Ozai starts kicking the shit out of Aang. Aang enters the avatar state... And wreck shot completely decimates all of Ozai's defenses. Gets close enough that he's about to deal the killing blow with his own. I believe it's actually firebending that he's going to use to kill yeah. Ozai in the Avatar form, only to catch himself pull out of the Avatar form at the last second and not kill Ozai. Uh, only for Ozai to call him a little pussy ass bitch for not committing murder and about to attack Ang, like essentially stabbing them back with firebending, but Ang using Toff's technique of feeling the vibrations from the earth, senses Ozai's movements, and immediately pins him down in rock and starts the it's such energy a, bending. It's process. such a badass moment because they played in slow motion where like Ozai's like wielding up to shoot the fire and like at the last second Aang redirects his fist up in the so air just so the fire just shoots up into the sky. Yeah, doesn't even use any bending, just pure martial arts just redirects his arm movements and, and then pins him in fucking pins him into the ground. <laughs> yeah, it's awesome. And then he does the weird face goo shooty thing that absorbs all of his fire And then, skills. of course, and understandably, when his friends show up, it's like, is he dead? It's like, I'm still alive, you fools. And they recoil back in fear. It's like, I didn't kill him, but I took away his bending. Everyone else is like, what? You don't do that? No, that's not their reaction. Their reaction is immediately shitting on his eye endlessly. Oh, more like the loser king, not the phoenix king. <laughs> the loser lord. Also, how did they know he was calling himself the Phoenix King at this point? Because this was happen- this happened <laughs> just before he got on the airship. More like the king of getting your butt kicked. And then Suku tries to turn and she's like, more like the king at being bad at stuff. And Sokka's like, J- just let us handle it, buddy. This- we're good at making jokes. You less so. Just leave the naming to us. <laughs> yes. 
Yeah, so Aang becomes the full-on Avatar, and uh, Ozai is defeated. Peace is brought to the world. Zuko is put into power. He initially tried to get Iroh to take it, but I was like, I don't deserve that power. I know myself well enough. Zuko, you need to take it, because you're proud. The most honorable person I know. You fought for your own honor, uh, so you should have it. And you should bring honor back to the Fire Nation. Which is what he does. And the last scene we get is... Zuko going to confront Ozai about his mother and where she is, and that leads into a kind of side story that's... Yeah. The best part is fucking... So Legend of Korra does pick up right where... It, well, not right where it left off, like but it picks up... After. I think it's like 60 years later. Mm. Uh, but a child is asking uh, Katara, who's old at this point, what happened with Zuko's mother... And she, like, starts to explain, and then another child turns up and is like, I don't want to hear about that shit, let's talk about something else. Yep. It's just like, cool, so we're still not going to address what happened with Zuko's mother, and I have to read a fucking completely separate comic book to understand what happened with mm. Zuko's mother. Yep. But yeah. That's... Avatar. Uh, Avatar in a rough, jumbled up sum. Yeah, overall, like, the world is, well, like, quite the thing. I would love to delve into it more. Yeah, it's amazingly written, and I have yet to actually read the story about Suko's mother myself, but I fully plan to at some point. Yeah. Uh, that detail I shared where she uh, concocts a poison for Fire Lord Ozai so that he can kill the father and take over the role of Fire Lord, that comes from that story. Mm, yeah. In case you were unclear as to where I pulled that information. I kind of figured as well. Yeah, the, ser- the show like very heavily hints that she killed him and left yeah. All right. So, do we have any questions for the audience? What was your favorite character from the show? One of my favorite characters being the cabbage salesman. What tribe do you think, or what a elemental bending do you would you most like to have access to? Yeah, that's a better question. <laughs> Uh, and feel free to go, or even better. So we talked about how, oh, fuck, no, I need to know now. I was going to ask what the airbending uh, further development is, since we already have lightning bending, blood bending, and metal bending. But you tell me right. Legend of Korra okay. answers that. What the fuck is the new form of so airbending? So you find out in the, I think it was the final, yeah, it was the final season of Legend of Korra. I think it was the final season? But um, one of the villains kind of reveals it. It's uh, when an airbender successfully detaches themselves from all material things and all worldly desires. Makes sense why they're nomads, yeah. They get the ability to fly. Jesus fucking Christ. Yeah, it's kind of dumb. Such complete and utter bullshit. Alright, yeah, no. Additional question in addition to what element would you most like to bend? What's a better evolved form of airbending? Because that's bullshit. Personally, yeah, personally, I think lightning would be the better form. Yeah. And Lightning take that from bending. fire, come up with something better for fire. Oh, fire gets like fucking lava bending. I'd be down Earth for that. Earthbenders already have that. Fuck, firebending gets like... It's just like uh, uh, waterbenders have ice bending already. Yeah. I guess that makes sense. Uh, yeah, give give me what better forms. <laughs> like, like Vacuum bending. Black holes. Plasma or something. No, black so, holes. <laughs> Alright, so question the first. What element would you most like to bend? Uh, question the second... Just give me better forms of evolved bending that they weren't using in the show. Do we have any recommendations? Yes. Uh, I'll start with mine. Because what I want to recommend is another show that's currently airing. The first two or three seasons are out now, and the fourth one is going to start soon. It's been delayed because of all the events going on currently in the world. But um, the series is called The Dragon Prince. and It's by the same people who did this Yes, the same... One of the same people, the writer, the head writer of Avatar, is also one of the head writers of The Dragon Prince. So it follows a lot of the same story beats, but in a different setting, where it's a world of magic. Humans can't use magic, and because of something that had happened in the past, they were exiled to a different part of the continent and like, banned from ever returning. Keith, do you have a recommendation? So uh, I have a recommendation for a book series, which I believe also got an anime series, which Kind of a similar feel, uh, feel to Avatar, which is called The Twelve Kingdoms. Uh, it's about this other world that it's a world that's broken up into 12 kingdoms and like this star-shaped continent. And essentially there's these people that when you're born within a region, uh, you're born from these fruit. And whenever the king or like the emperor or empress of this area dies, another person's picked. And the story follows this girl who is one of these people that was from the fruit. But something happened in a storm, and the tree that she was being born from got ejected into this whirlpool, and she ended up in our world. 
and it's her getting pulled back into this world because once a person is determined to be the next ruler, there's no other way about it. You're the ruler or you're dead. Huh. Uh, and I'm actually going to recommend a video game uh, from the early 2000s called Jade Empire. Uh, it's another game... A, well, not another game. It's a game uh, kind of where the world is heavily based off of ancient Chinese and their lore. Uh, you play as a monk who... Uh, uses that to perform combat with other people, but also you master the elements over the course of the game and use them to also perform combat with other people. And you have to deal with a brutal dictator who's trying to take over the world. There's twists, turns, betrayal. It's a fun game, uh, which is reminiscent in certain ways to Avatar, I'll say. Don't want to give too much away. Interesting. And uh, unless you guys have anything to say, or if anyone's managed to guess what our episode is about... Not to date, nope. Nope, I'll just quickly double check the old email inbox, make sure no one has contacted us. Uh, oh, we actually did get an email since our last episode, or I believe it's since our last episode, uh, recommending we talk about the Zoom dick incident. Uh, I don't know, maybe, um, I don't think we'll do a full episode about it, but maybe we'll read up a bit more and talk about it during the preamble of our next episode. I don't know, but it was a reporter guy that during a Zoom meeting... Uh, thought that he had turned off his camera, but apparently he was doing it pantsless. So when he stood oh. up, his dick was all there. Oh, okay. Okay. Well then, don't think we'll be able to get a full episode out of that, but uh, I'll think of he, something. Here's a hint. Zoom meetings, great time to not wear pants, but you should still definitely be wearing underwear during them. Just in case. Uh, there you go, Hana. We have now talked about the Zoom dick incident. <laughs> So, thank you for tuning in for to yet another exciting episode of What Is My Podcast About? A podcast where, as I've already mentioned, we air once every two weeks and we talk, try to talk about uh, various topics and such. If you have an idea of what you want us to talk about, feel free to contact us at our email, whatismypodcastabout at gmail.com. And uh, you can follow us on any podcast st streaming service or you can even tune in and watch us on YouTube. Well, not watch, but listen on YouTube. And, uh, yeah. Tune in next time when we're talking about something. Yeah, make sure to tune in next time when we find out what happens when you put a bunch of fictional characters into a submarine. Yeah. It should prove to be a story. <laughs>